Greetings everyone and welcome back to my third STM32 video. Before we dive in, I really want to review some of the things we covered in the last video. The last video is incredibly important to this whole series. I'd really recommend going back to watch it if you haven't already. In that video, I talked about how registers control every aspect of a microcontroller. For example, I talked about this GPIOA output data register which directly controls pins tied to the STM32. Now if we had to set every single register on our own, we'd spend a lot of time reading data sheets and writing really ugly code. So to help us out, there's tools like CubeMX. This helps a lot with the initial setup. Anywhere from configuring which pins are inputs and outputs, to naming pins which make them easier to use later, as well as configuring the clock and any other peripherals that we might need. Just as a reminder, this tool only generates code. You don't even have to use it if you don't want to. Everything that this tool does, you can do in code later. You can even look at the code that it generates as inspiration for your own. Once all the setup and configuration is done, we move on to writing code. And once again, to save us from reading data sheets and manipulating registers directly, we can use the hardware abstraction layer, or HAL. It lets us do things like toggle this pin and wait one second without actually knowing what registers are changing behind the scenes. And once again, if you want to change the registers directly, you can. You don't have to use this at all. That's all for the review. Now let's get down to business. Before we jump into any of the advanced features of an STM32, we need to lay some groundwork. So I've gathered a small list of things that I consider essential to learning a new microcontroller. I'm sure a lot of you are already familiar with Arduino, so I'm listing things here in the way that they're used in the Arduino ecosystem. First up, we have the hello world of microcontrollers, which is being able to control a single pin on and off. This is what we did in the last video. We can turn a pin on and off using digital write. And conversely, we can detect if something else is pulling our pin high or low using digital read. But now if you want more control than on and off, and you want to have a sliding scale for something like brightness, then we're getting into the world of analog. So the next two bits of essential functionality is being able to do an analog read or an analog write. Now, if you don't have any sense of timing with a microcontroller, you're going to get stuck quick. So we also want to know how to get our timing just right. We can do that with blocking commands like delay or delay microseconds. These lock up the processor for a certain amount of time and don't let anything else happen. Or we can use things like millis and micros, which allow us to keep time without actually locking up the processor. After this, we want to be able to debug our code. If we're having any problems, we usually want to step through our code in small chunks to figure out where the problem is starting. With Arduino, it's really common to just use serial to print things off to the screen. You can do this with an STM32, but there's better ways to debug. And lastly, the three most common forms of communication that I come across are serial, once again, as well as I2C and SPI. We already covered digital write in the last video, and I don't want to waste a whole video on just digital read. So today we're going to jump into the world of analog, specifically analog write. So let's figure out how to do analog write, but on an STM32. In Arduino, it's pretty simple. We just say analog write and then pass in a byte, which is any value from 0 to 255. If we give it 0, we'll have a 0 volt output. If we give it the maximum number, 255, we have 5 volt output. But what happens if we give it something in between, like 128? Are we going to get something around 2.5 volts? Well, let's try it out for ourselves. I'm making a quick Arduino program to do analog write 128. And when I hook it up to my multimeter, it looks like it's actually around 2.5 volts. But if I hook this same signal up to my oscilloscope, we can see what's really going on. We're not really creating a true 2.5 volts. Instead, we're just toggling the pin on and off really fast to simulate it. The average voltage over time is around 2.5 volts, which is what my multimeter is measuring. But if you're to look at the pin at any moment in time, it's either 0 volts or 5 volts. Turning the pin on and off really fast to simulate an analog voltage is referred to as PWM, or pulse width modulation. We control how long the pin is on or off, and then the average voltage over time will be our fake analog output. Now there are microcontrollers that can do a true analog output. This is often referred to as DAC, which is a digital to analog converter. And if you had one of these fancy microcontrollers, it would have some internal circuitry that looks similar to this, which would allow you to have a true analog output. Microcontrollers are digital, so it's really easy for them to do something that's either off or on, but it's very difficult for them to do something that's somewhere in between. And that's one of the reasons why PWM is so popular. For a lot of cases, turning the pin on and off really quick does a good enough job. For example, you could use PWM to control the brightness of an LED or the speed of a motor. In my last example, I turned the pin on and off at equal intervals. And this means that our average voltage is halfway between 0 and 5 volts, which was 2.5 volts in my example. And if we want an output voltage that's lower, all we have to do is leave the pin on for less time. So in this example, the pin is on for 25% of the time and off for 75% of the time. By changing the width of this pulse, we're changing our output voltage. And that's where the name pulse width modulation comes from. How long you leave the pulse on is referred to as the duty cycle. This first example here has a 50% duty cycle, and the one underneath it has a 25% duty cycle. 
And if you're curious, this is what it looks like when you change the duty cycle on the fly. You can notice how the width of the pulse increases or decreases, as well as how my multimeter is measuring the average voltage. Let's revisit how Arduino handles PWM. They give us this analog write command, which only asks us for a pin and a duty cycle. That's pretty straightforward. STM32, on the other hand, asks us for quite a few more things. So before we jump into how to configure this, let's talk a little bit more about how a microcontroller generates a PWM signal. Let's start by counting to eight over and over again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We did it. Now let's do it again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We're going to do that same thing again, but this time I'm going to give you a thumbs up or thumbs down. I'm going to give you a thumbs up if I say a number that's seven or higher. If it's not seven or higher, you're getting a thumbs down. Let's do this again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. What we just did there is created a PWM signal, specifically one with 25% duty cycle, where you had a thumbs up 25% of the time. By giving a thumbs up for any number that's greater than or equal to 7, we have a 25% duty cycle. Now since I'm only counting to 8, there's a very small number of possible combinations. Here's all of them listed. Depending on what number I decide to start giving you a thumbs up on, that affects the duty cycle. And here's a list of all the possible duty cycles that we could get to by counting from 1 to 8. What if we wanted a duty cycle that's not on this list? For example, what if we wanted something around 92%? That would fall somewhere in between 100 and 87.5. Well, that's pretty easy. We can just count to a higher number. Now we have much more control over what our duty cycle actually is. It's nice that we have more control over our duty cycle, but the drawback is that it takes longer to count to that number. Both of these are examples of 25% duty cycle, but counting from 1 to 32 takes four times as long as counting from 1 to 8. That means that in the time that it takes us to count from 1 to 32, we could instead count from 1 to 8 four times over. The number of times that we repeat this cycle per second is referred to as the frequency of PWM and the number that we count to is often referred to as the resolution. There's almost always a trade-off between frequency and resolution. The more precise your duty cycle is, the longer it's going to take to count. Here's an example of what I mean. These are two PWM signals, both outputting around 9% duty cycle. The blue one has four times the resolution, but it also takes four times as long for it to count that high. Let's zoom out to get a better look. For every blue pulse, there are four yellow pulses. We can count this by picking a starting point, like the rising edge of a blue pulse, and counting how many yellow pulses there are until we hit the next rising edge. I set my oscilloscope to measure both the period and frequency of both of these signals. The period is how long it takes for the signal to repeat. So here we can see that the period of the blue signal is four times that of the yellow. The frequency is how many times this pattern repeats per second. Since the yellow signal takes less time to repeat, the frequency is four times that of the blue. Cool, now we understand the basics of PWM. Let's quickly run over the terms that we just covered. The first is duty cycle. This is how long the pin stays on compared to how long it stays off. The higher the duty cycle, the higher the analog voltage. Next we have resolution. Resolution is the number that we count up to. This affects how granular we can make our duty cycle. If our resolution is small, we can run really fast. But if we have a big resolution, it takes a lot longer. And this directly affects the frequency, which is how many times we start the cycle over every second. One other buzzword that I'm not going to cover in this video is mode. The only thing worth mentioning is that this video has been focusing on something called fast PWM. With this information, let's try out a math problem. We're going to try to figure out what the PWM frequency would be for a microcontroller running at 72 megahertz with an 8-bit PWM resolution. Let's reword this problem. If we assume that we can count up one number per clock cycle, that means that with a 72 megahertz clock, we could count up 72 million times every second. And an 8-bit resolution means that there's 256 numbers. So each PWM cycle consists of 256 counts. So we're really trying to figure out how many of these counting cycles we can do every second. This is how I like to write out my math problems. We're able to do 72 million counts every one second. And there is one cycle for every 256 counts. So doing the math, this gives us just over 218,000 cycles per second. This means that our PWM frequency is 218,250 hertz. And we'll just simplify this to 218 kilohertz. The STM32 blue pill runs at 72 megahertz. So this means that if we had a resolution of 256, our PWM frequency would be 218 kilohertz. For comparison, an Arduino Uno runs at 16 megahertz. If it followed these same rules, it would be able to run at a maximum of around 62 kilohertz. However, by default, it only runs at 490 hertz or 980 hertz, depending on which pin you use. I've cranked this up to the max speed before, but you have to play around with registers manually. 
Now at this point we should have enough knowledge that we can get PWM working at a basic level on our STM32. Just like in the last video, I'm going to use the STM32 Cube IDE to set up this project. If any of this doesn't look familiar, I'd recommend going back to my previous video because I cover all of this setup in great detail. This first time I'm going to do this with the blue pill and then I'm going to come through and do it a second time with the Nucleo. I'm creating a blank project and I'm going to call it Blue Pill PWM. Just as a reminder, this part of the program is called CubeMX. It gives us a graphical way to set up the microcontroller and then when we're done, it will generate the code that actually sets the registers for us. To get PWM set up, we need to go find one of those magic counters. And those magic counters are actually called timers and we can get to them from this drop down menu right here. On the blue pill, we can see that we have four built in timers called timers 1, 2, 3, and 4. At their core, each timer is just a counter. However, sometimes timers are designed with specific functionality in mind, so it's not uncommon to see different settings for different timers. Additionally, each timer affects a different set of pins. So the timer that you choose will dictate which pins you're allowed to use with it. I'm not going to use timer 1, and I'll show you why later. So instead, we're going to start with timer 2. As soon as we open it, we can start to see some configuration. We want our counter to increment once every single time that the system clock ticks. So because of this, we're going to set our clock source to be the internal clock. As soon as we do that, we can see some configuration that shows up down here. These channels are going to be the output pins, but we'll come back to those in a sec. For now, let's look at this configuration. I'm going to drag this so we can see the full name of these pins, and expand my view a little bit so we can read everything. The first thing that we have is this prescaler. And this means how many clock cycles do we want to wait before incrementing our number once. And for the sake of simplicity, I want our number to count up once every single time that the system clock ticks, so I'm just going to leave this as the default zero. If I wanted to slow this down, I could set this to a number like 4, which means that we'd wait 4 system clock ticks before incrementing our number once. Counter mode, as you can imagine, is whether or not we're counting up or down. Next we have our counter period, which is the maximum number that we're going to count up to before we start over. To follow my example that we did the math for earlier, I'm going to set this to 255. This means that our counter is going to count from 0 up to 255 and then start over. Next we have the internal clock division, which is another way to divide our clock signal if we want this to run slower. The next thing is auto reload preload, and this will automatically restart our counter when we reach that maximum number. When we're using PWM, we just want that cycle to keep going and going and going, and we don't have to want to restart it with code every single time. So by setting this to enable, it's going to automatically start back at zero when it reaches that maximum number of 255. These next two parameters down here I've only ever used when I want to use one timer to trigger another timer. So it's not applicable to PWM. So now at this point we've set up a timer which is just going to count from 0 to 255 and it's going to count up one number per system clock cycle. And then restart when we get to the end. Now it's time to actually set up the PWM output pin. So we're going to drag this down so we can see. I'm going to select channel 1. The channel doesn't really matter, it just affects what pin we're going to be using. By default it's set to disable meaning that the pin is going to be doing nothing. We want to set this as an output pin, so we're actually driving the pin high and low, and that gives us these four options near the bottom here that are outputs. Well, actually only two of them are outputs, because two of them literally say no output right in their name. I'll touch back on output compare in a bit, but we're going to use PWM generation. Now obviously we don't want to use the no output because it's not actually going to drive the pin. So far I've never actually had a use for this. If we did select it, it would generate a PWM signal, but it just wouldn't actually drive the pin. So I guess if you're doing something really weird, you could maybe use this as a source to another timer or something. But of course, we actually want to drive our pin high and low, so we're going to select PWM generation on channel 1. The moment we select that, we can see that this pin here went green. And that means that pin PA0 is our PWM output pin now. Also, when we did that, it added more configuration here at the bottom. This configuration is specific for this pin, whereas the counting stuff that we did earlier affects all four of those channels. Let's make this bigger so we can see everything that's going on. This mode is that thing that I told you that we don't need to worry about right now. If you're curious, you can look up mode 1 versus mode 2 in the datasheet. This next value here affects our duty cycle, and this is saying how long do we want our pulse to be. If I wanted to have somewhere around a 10% duty cycle, I could set this value to be about 1 tenth of what this number is. So I'm going to set this to 25, and we should get pretty close to a 10% duty cycle. I rarely ever touch these next two settings. But every once in a while I like to change the polarity, which just flips the entire graph. So rather than staying on for 25 out of 255 clock cycles, we'll stay off for 25 and then be on the rest of the time. But we're just going to leave this as the default value high. So that's it. The only thing that really mattered for this channel was to set this pulse value right here. And this will give us a roughly 10% duty cycle output.
Okay, let's see what happens if we push this code onto the microcontroller. We're going to want to start by clicking on this save icon, which will generate our code. Do we want to generate code? Yeah. And then we're asked if we want to switch perspectives, which is just a different window layout. So sure. Zoom, 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 zoom. Zoom, 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 zoom. Zoom. So here's the code that it generated. And if we scroll down, we can start to see some code that has to do with our timer, such as this right here. If we go down a little bit further, we can see where it's actually called, which is right here, the MX Tim 2 init. And if we actually want to jump to the function itself, we can either hit Control on Windows or Command on Mac and then click. And then it jumps us to the actual implementation. Now if we peruse through this, we can probably see all the things that we set through the configurator, such as our period of 255, and a little bit lower is our pulse of 25, and then pretty much everything else was set at its default value. Once again, to demonstrate what's actually happening here, I'm going to strip out all these comments to make it look a little simpler. So here's our main function with all the comments stripped out. It starts by initializing the hardware abstraction layer, followed by the clock configuration. Next, we can see where it has the GPIO initialization, which does things such as setting a pin as an input or an output. And then we have our timer2 configuration, which is what we just ran through. So that means any point beyond this, our timer is already set up. Now the question is, is this all we need to do to get PWM to work? Let's see what happens if we push this onto our microcontroller. We just need to click on this little play icon here. Since this is the first time launching for this project, it's asking us how we want to debug. All the defaults are fine here, so I'm just going to click on OK. And I just remembered that I haven't plugged everything in yet, so I'm going to do that before I click OK here. I'm going to plug in the STLink v2 programmer. The last code I had on this was a blink example, which we can see here. And now I just need to move the jumper into program mode and reset the microcontroller. And we can see that the LED stopped blinking now that it's in program mode. Now that everything's plugged in, we're ready to keep uploading. So when I click OK, it's going to save and then continue pushing the code under the microcontroller. You can see down here the, the progress. And it looks like we're done. I lied. Now we are done. Now we just need to switch the jumper back and press reset. This puts us in run mode. I hooked up my oscilloscope to pin A0 to see what's happening, but it doesn't look like PWM is working. The reason we don't see any PWM output is because we haven't actually started the timer yet. I really wish that they added like a checkbox to the MX configuration to say auto start timer so that they could just generate this code for you. But since that doesn't exist, we're gonna do it manually. We can do this by typing in HAL underscore TIM underscore, and I think it's PWM, and I'm going to hit control space for autocomplete. It's PWM start. Yep, there we go. So there's three options here. We have PWM start regular. We have start with DMA, which is direct memory access or addressing or something, uh, and then start with an interrupt. We're not doing anything complicated, so we're just going to use the basic start function. The first argument, it wants to autocomplete for us, which is the HTIM2 variable. So we're going to do that. This is a reference to the actual timer itself. It's defined near the top of our code right here. And we can see where it's used down in our generated code down here, where it says htim2.instance is tim2 and all of the other variables that we set during the configuration. So we've got this reference to the actual timer, and now we just need to tell it which channel to turn on. And we can do that with tim underscore channel. I'm going to hit control space for autocomplete. And we use tim channel 1. Now, I did actually learn this little trick. If you highlight this, then it will tell you what this is actually expanded to. So in this case, tim channel 1 is really just the number 0. We could put the number 0 in here, and it would do the exact same thing. So we're going to end this with a semicolon. And now I'm going to put the blue pill into program mode so we can push the code. All right, it's in program mode, so I'm going to hit play, save our code, and let's see if it works. Gucci. Hey, look, we have PWM. I'm going to play around with the zoom and the horizontal scale so I can get two pulses in the view. And now if we look down at this bottom corner here, we can actually see where my oscilloscope is measuring the duty cycle. And it looks like it says it's about 9.718. If you take our pulse width, which was 25, and divide it by 256, which is the resolution that we set it to, that should come out to about 9.7% duty cycle. So it looks like this is working just how it's supposed to. Okay, everyone, I'm going to wrap things up here. This video is getting a little bit long, and there's still a handful of things that I want to talk about. So I'll cover these in PWM Part 2. I specifically want to show you how to change the duty cycle through code rather than just leaving it at that one fixed value. And I also want to talk about why you can't use Timer 1 for PWM.
And then of course, I promised that I would do this with the Nucleo board, so I also want to do all of this again with the Nucleo. Thanks for being patient while I put this together. It took me six days to film this. Well, that's all. See you next time. For comparison, an Arduino Uno running at 15... I just saw a cat.